Section 7 of History of the United States. Part 7. Progressive Democracy and the World War. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of the United States by Charles A. Beard and Mary Ritter Beard. Part 7. Progressive Democracy and the World War. Section 7. President Wilson and the World War. Continued. The United States and the European War. The Outbreak of the War. In the opening days of August 1914, the age-long jealousies of European nations, sharpened by new imperial ambitions, broke out in another general conflict such as had shaken the world in the days of Napoleon. On June 28, the heir to the Austro-Hungarian throne was assassinated at Sarajevo, the capital of Bosnia, an Austrian province occupied mainly by Serbs. With a view to stopping Serbian agitation for independence, Austria-Hungary laid the blame for this incident on the government of Serbia and made humiliating demands on that country. Germany at once proposed that the issue should be regarded as an affair which should be settled solely between Austria-Hungary and Serbia, meaning that the small nation should be left to the tender mercies of a great power. Russia refused to take this view. Great Britain proposed a settlement by mediation. Germany backed up Austria to the limit. To use the language of the German authorities, we were perfectly aware that a possible warlike attitude of Austria-Hungary against Serbia might bring Russia upon the field, and that it might therefore involve us in a war, in accordance with our duties as allies. We could not, however, in these vital interests of Austria-Hungary which were at stake, advise our ally to take a yielding attitude not compatible with his dignity, nor deny him our assistance. That made the war inevitable. Every day of the fateful August, 1914, was crowded with momentous events. On the 1st, Germany declared war on Russia. On the 2nd, the Germans invaded the little duchy of Luxembourg, and notified the King of Belgium that they were preparing to violate the neutrality of his realm on their way to Paris. On the same day, Great Britain, anxiously besought by the French government, promised the aid of the British Navy if German warships made hostile demonstrations in the Channel. August 3rd, the German government declared war on France. The following day, Great Britain demanded of Germany respect for Belgian neutrality and, failing to receive the guarantee, broke off diplomatic relations. On the 5th, the British Prime Minister announced that war had opened between England and Germany. The storm now broke in all its pitiless fury. THE STATE OF AMERICAN OPINION Although President Wilson promptly proclaimed the neutrality of the United States, the sympathies of a large majority of the American people were without doubt on the side of Great Britain and France. To them the invasion of the little kingdom of Belgium and the horrors that accompanied German occupation were odious in the extreme. Moreover, they regarded the German imperial government as an autocratic power wielded in the interest of an ambitious military party. The Kaiser, William II, and the Crown Prince were the symbols of royal arrogance, on the other hand, many Americans of German descent, in memory of their ties with the fatherland, openly sympathized with the central powers, and many Americans of Irish descent, recalling their long and bitter struggle for home rule in Ireland, would have regarded British defeat as a merited redress of ancient grievances. Extremely sensitive to American opinion, but ill-informed about it, the German government soon began systematic efforts to present its cause to the people of the United States in the most favorable light possible. Dr. Bernhard Dernberg, the former colonial secretary of the German Empire, was sent to America as a special agent. For months he filled the newspapers, magazines, and periodicals with interviews, articles, and notes on the justice of the Teutonic cause. From a press bureau in New York flowed a stream of pamphlets, leaflets, and cartoons. A magazine, The Fatherland, was founded to secure fair play for Germany and Austria. Several professors in American universities, who had received their training in Germany, took up the pen in defense of the central empires. The German language press, without exception it seems, the National German Alliance, minor German societies, and Lutheran churches came to the support of the German cause. Even the English language papers, though generally favorable to the Entente allies, opened their columns in the interest of equal justice to the spokesmen for all the contending powers of Europe. Before two weeks had elapsed, 
The controversy had become so intense that President Wilson, August 18, 1914, was moved to caution his countrymen against falling into angry disputes. Every man, he said, who really loves America will act and speak in the true spirit of neutrality, which is the spirit of impartiality and fairness and friendliness to all concerned. We must be impartial in thought as well as in action, must put a curb upon our sentiments as well as upon every transaction that might be construed as a preference of one party to the struggle before another. THE CLASH OVER AMERICAN TRADE As in the time of the Napoleonic Wars, the conflict in Europe raised fundamental questions respecting rights of Americans trading with countries at peace as well as those at war. On this point there existed on August 1, 1914, a fairly definite body of principles by which nations were bound. Among them the following were of vital significance. In the first place, it was recognized that an enemy merchant ship caught on the high seas was a legitimate prize of war which might be seized and confiscated. In the second place, it was agreed that contraband of war found on an enemy or neutral ship was a lawful prize. Any ship suspected of carrying it was liable to search, and if caught with forbidden goods, was subject to seizure. In the third place, international law prescribed that a peaceful merchant ship, whether belonging to an enemy or to a neutral country, should not be destroyed or sunk without provision for the safety of crew and passengers. In the fourth place, it was understood that a belligerent had the right, if it could, to blockade the ports of an enemy and prevent the ingress and egress of all ships, but such a blockade, to be lawful, had to be effective. These general principles left undetermined two important matters, what is an effective blockade, and what is contraband of war. The task of answering these questions fell to Great Britain as mistress of the seas. Although the German submarines made it impossible for her battleships to maintain a continuous patrol of the waters in front of blockaded ports, she declared the blockade to be nonetheless effective because her navy was supreme. As to contraband of war, Great Britain put such a broad interpretation upon the term as to include nearly every important article of commerce. Early in 1915 she declared even cargoes of grain and flour to be contraband, defending the action on the ground that the German government had recently taken possession of all domestic stocks of corn, wheat, and flour. A new question arose in connection with American trade with the neutral countries surrounding Germany. Great Britain early began to intercept ships carrying oil, gasoline, and copper, all war materials of prime importance, on the ground that they either were destined ultimately to Germany or would release goods for sale to Germans. On November 2, 1914, the English government announced that the Germans were sowing mines in open waters, and that therefore the whole of the North Sea was a military zone. Ships bound for Denmark, Norway, and Sweden were ordered to come by the English Channel for inspection and sailing directions. In effect, Americans were now licensed by Great Britain to trade in certain commodities and in certain amounts with neutral countries. Against these extraordinary measures, the State Department at Washington lodged pointed objections, saying, This government is reluctantly forced to the conclusion that the present policy of His Majesty's government toward neutral ships and cargoes exceeds the manifest necessity of a belligerent, and constitutes restrictions upon the rights of American citizens on the high seas, which are not justified by the rules of international law or required under the principle of self-preservation. Germany begins the submarine campaign. Germany now announced that, on and after February 18, 1915, the whole of the English Channel and the waters around Great Britain would be deemed a war zone, and that every ship found therein would be destroyed. The German decree added that, as the British Admiralty had ordered the use of neutral flags by English ships in time of distress, neutral vessels would be in danger of destruction if found in the forbidden area. It was clear that Germany intended to employ submarines to destroy shipping. A new factor was thus introduced into naval warfare, one not provided for in the accepted laws of war. A warship overhauling a merchant vessel could easily take its crew and passengers on board for safekeeping as prescribed by international law, but a submarine ordinarily could do nothing of the sort. Of necessity the lives and the ships of neutrals, as well as of belligerents, were put in mortal peril. This amazing conduct Germany justified on the ground that it was mere retaliation against Great Britain for her violations of international law. 
the response of the united states to the ominous german order was swift and direct on february tenth nineteen fifteen it warned germany that if her commanders destroyed american lives and ships in obedience to that decree the action would be very hard indeed to reconcile with the friendly relations happily subsisting between the two governments the american note added that the german imperial government would be held to strict accountability and all necessary steps would be taken to safeguard american lives and american rights this was firm and clear language but the only response which it evoked from germany was a suggestion that if great britain would allow food supplies to pass through the blockade the submarine campaign would be dropped violations of american rights meanwhile germany continued to ravage shipping on the high seas on january twenty eighth a german raider sank the american ship william p fry in the south atlantic on march twenty eighth a british ship the falaba was sunk by a submarine and many on board including an american citizen were killed and on april twenty eighth a german airplane dropped bombs on the american steamer cushing on the morning of may first nineteen fifteen americans were astounded to see in the newspapers an advertisement signed by the german imperial embassy warning travelers of the dangers in the war zone and notifying them that any who ventured on british ships into that area did so at their own risk on that day the lusitania a british steamer sailed from new york to liverpool on may seven without any warning the ship was struck by two torpedoes and in a few minutes went down by the bow carrying to death one thousand one hundred and fifty three persons including one hundred fourteen american men women and children a cry of horror ran through the country the german papers in america and a few american people argued that american citizens had been duly warned of the danger and had deliberately taken their lives into their own hands but the terrible deed was almost universally condemned by public opinion the lusitania notes on may fourteenth the department of state at washington made public the first of three famous notes on the lusitania case it solemnly informed the german government that no warning that an unlawful and inhumane act will be committed can possibly be accepted as an excuse or palliation for that act or as an abatement of the responsibility for its commission it called upon the german government to disavow the act make reparation as far as possible and take steps to prevent the recurrence of anything so obviously subversive to the principles of warfare the note closed with a clear caution to germany that the government of the united states would not omit any word or any act necessary to the performance of its sacred duty of maintaining the rights of the united states and its citizens and of safeguarding their free exercise and enjoyment the die was cast but germany in reply merely temporized in a second note made public on june eleventh the position of the united states was again affirmed william jennings bryan the secretary of state had resigned because the drift of president wilson's policy was not toward mediation but the strict maintenance of american rights if need be by force of arms the german reply was still evasive and german naval commanders continued their course of sinking merchant ships in a third and final note of july twenty first nineteen fifteen president wilson made it clear to germany that he meant what he said when he wrote that he would maintain the rights of american citizens finally after much discussion and shifting about the german ambassador on september first nineteen fifteen sent a brief note to the secretary of state liners will not be sunk by our submarines without warning and without safety of the lives of non-combatants provided the liners do not try to escape or offer resistance editorially the new york times declared it is a triumph not only of diplomacy but of reason of humanity of justice and of truth the secretary of state saw in it a recognition of the fundamental principles for which we have contended the presidential election of nineteen sixteen in the midst of this crisis came the presidential campaign on the republican side everything seemed to depend upon the action of the progressives if the breach created in nineteen twelve could be closed victory was possible if not defeat was certain a promise of unity lay in the fact that the conventions of the republicans and progressives were held simultaneously in chicago the friends of roosevelt hoped that both parties would select him as their candidate but this hope was not realized the republicans chose and the progressives accepted charles e hughes 
an associate justice of the federal supreme court who as governor of new york had won a national reputation by waging war on machine politicians in the face of the clamor for expressions of sympathy with one or the other of the contending powers of europe the republicans chose a middle course declaring that they would uphold all american rights at home and abroad by land and by sea this sentiment mr hughes echoed in his acceptance speech by some it was interpreted to mean a firmer policy in dealing with great britain by others a more vigorous handling of the submarine menace the democrats on their side renominated president wilson by acclamation reviewed with pride the legislative achievements of the party and commended the splendid diplomatic victories of our great president who has preserved the vital interests of our government and its citizens and kept us out of war in the election which ensued president wilson's popular vote exceeded that cast for mr hughes by more than half a million while his electoral vote stood two hundred seventy seven to two hundred fifty four the result was regarded and not without warrant as a great personal triumph for the president he had received the largest vote yet cast for a presidential candidate the progressive party practically disappeared and the socialists suffered a severe setback falling far behind the vote of nineteen twelve president wilson urges peace upon the warring nations apparently convinced that his pacific policies had been profoundly approved by his countrymen president wilson soon after the election addressed peace notes to the european belligerents on december sixteenth the german emperor proposed to the allied powers that they enter into peace negotiations a suggestion that was treated as a mere political maneuver by the opposing governments two days later president wilson sent a note to the warring nations asking them to avow the terms upon which war might be concluded to these notes the central powers replied that they were ready to meet their antagonists in a peace conference and allied powers answered by presenting certain conditions precedent to a satisfactory settlement on january twenty second nineteen seventeen president wilson in an address before the senate declared it to be a duty of the united states to take part in the establishment of a stable peace on the basis of certain principles these were in short peace without victory the right of nationalities to freedom and self-government the independence of poland freedom of the seas the reduction of armaments and the abolition of entangling alliances the whole world was discussing the president's remarkable message when it was dumbfounded to hear on january thirty first that the german ambassador at washington had announced the official renewal of ruthless submarine warfare the united states at war steps toward war three days after the receipt of the news that the german government intended to return to its former submarine policy president wilson severed diplomatic relations with the german empire at the same time he explained to congress that he desired no conflict with germany and would await an overt act before taking further steps to preserve american rights god grant he concluded that we may not be challenged to defend them by acts of willful injustice on the part of the government of germany yet the challenge came between february twenty sixth and april second six american merchant vessels were torpedoed in most cases without any warning and without regard to the loss of american lives president wilson therefore called upon congress to answer the german menace the reply of congress on april sixth was a resolution passed with only a few dissenting votes declaring the existence of a state of war with germany austria-hungary at once severed diplomatic relations with the united states but it was not until december seventh that congress acting on the president's advice declared war also on that vassal of the german government american war aims in many addresses at the beginning and during the course of the war president wilson stated the purposes which actuated our government in taking up arms he first made it clear that it was a war of self-defense the military masters of germany he exclaimed denied us the right to be neutral proof of that lay on every hand agents of the german imperial government had destroyed american lives and american property on the high seas they had filled our communities with spies they had planted bombs in ships and munition works they had fomented divisions among american citizens though assailed in many ways and compelled to resort to war the united states sought no material rewards the world must be made safe for democracy its peace must be planted upon the tested foundations of political liberty we have no selfish ends to serve we desire no conquest no dominion 
we seek no indemnities for ourselves. In a very remarkable message read to Congress on January 8, 1918, President Wilson laid down his famous 14 points, summarizing the ideals for which we were fighting. They included open treaties of peace openly arrived at, absolute freedom of navigation upon the seas, the removal, as far as possible, of trade barriers among nations, reduction of armaments, adjustment of colonial claims in the interest of the populations concerned, fair and friendly treatment of Russia, the restoration of Belgium, righting the wrong done to France in 1871 in the matter of Alsace-Lorraine, adjustment of Italian frontiers along the lines of nationality, more liberty for the peoples of Austria-Hungary, the restoration of Serbia and Romania, the readjustment of the Turkish Empire, an independent Poland, and an association of nations to afford mutual guarantees to all states great and small. On a later occasion, President Wilson elaborated the last point, namely, the formation of a League of Nations to guarantee peace and establish justice among the powers of the world. Democracy, the right of nations to determine their own fate, a covenant of enduring peace, these were the ideals for which the American people were to pour out their blood and treasure. The Selective Draft the world war became a war of nations. The powers against which we were arrayed had every able-bodied man in service and all their resources, human and material, thrown into the scale. For this reason, President Wilson summoned the whole people of the United States to make every sacrifice necessary for victory. Congress by law decreed that the national army should be chosen from all male citizens and males not enemy aliens who had declared their intention of becoming citizens. By the first act of May 18th, 1917, it fixed the age limits at 21 to 31 inclusive. Later, in August 1918, it extended them to 18 and 45. From the men of the first group so enrolled were chosen by lot the soldiers for the World War who, with the regular army and the National Guard, formed the American Expeditionary Force upholding the American cause on the battlefields of Europe. The whole nation, said the President, must be a team in which each man shall play the part for which he is best fitted. Liberty, loans, and taxes. In order that the military and naval forces should be stinted in no respect, the nation was called upon to place its financial resources at the service of the government. Some urged the conscription of wealth as well as men, meaning the support of the war out of taxes upon great fortunes, but more conservative counsels prevailed. Four great liberty loans were floated, all the agencies of modern publicity being employed to enlist popular interest. The first loan had four and a half million subscribers, the fourth more than twenty million. Combined with loans were heavy taxes. A progressive tax was laid upon incomes beginning with four percent on incomes in the lower ranges, and rising to sixty-three percent of that part of any income above two million dollars. A progressive tax was levied upon inheritances, an excess profits tax was laid upon all corporations and partnerships, rising in amount to 60% of the net income in excess of 33% on the invested capital. This, said a distinguished economist, is the high-water mark in the history of taxation. Never before in the annals of civilization has an attempt been made to take as much as two-thirds of a man's income by taxation. Mobilizing Material Resources no stone was left unturned to provide the arms, munitions, supplies, and transportation required in the gigantic undertaking. Between the declaration of war and the armistice, Congress enacted law after law relative to food supplies, raw materials, railways, mines, ships, forests, and industrial enterprises. No power over the lives and property of citizens, deemed necessary to the prosecution of the armed conflict, was withheld from the government. The farmer's wheat, the housewife's sugar, coal at the mines, labor in the factories, ships at the wharves, trade with friendly countries, the railways, banks, stores, private fortunes, all were mobilized and laid under whatever obligations the government deemed imperative. Never was a nation more completely devoted to a single cause. A law of August 10, 1917, gave the president power to fix the prices of wheat and coal and to take almost any steps necessary to prevent monopoly and excessive prices by a series of measures enlarging the principles of the shipping act of nineteen sixteen ships and shipyards were brought under public control and the government was empowered to embark upon a great shipbuilding program in december nineteen seventeen 
the government assumed for the period of the war the operation of the railways under a presidential proclamation which was elaborated in march nineteen eighteen by act of congress in the summer of nineteen eighteen the express telephone and telegraph business of the entire country passed under government control by war risk insurance acts allowances were made for the families of enlisted men compensation for injuries was provided death benefits were instituted and a system of national insurance was established in the interest of the men in service never before in the history of the country had the government taken such a wise and humane view of its obligations to those who served on the field of battle or on the seas the espionage and sedition acts by the espionage law of june fifteenth nineteen seventeen and the amending law known as the sedition act passed in may of the following year the government was given a drastic power over the expression of opinion the first measure penalized those who conveyed information to a foreign country to be used to the injury of the united states those who made false statements designed to interfere with the military or naval forces of the united states those who attempted to stir up insubordination or disloyalty in the army and navy and those who willfully obstructed enlistment the sedition act was still more severe and sweeping in its terms it imposed heavy penalties upon any person who used abusive language about the government or institutions of the country it authorized the dismissal of any officer of the government who committed disloyal acts or uttered disloyal language and empowered the postmaster general to close the mails to persons violating the law this measure prepared by the department of justice encountered vigorous opposition in the senate where twenty-four republicans and two democrats voted against it senator johnson of california denounced it as a law to suppress the freedom of the press in the united states and to prevent any man no matter who he is from expressing legitimate criticism concerning the present government the constitutionality of the acts was attacked but they were sustained by the supreme court and stringently enforced labor and the war in view of the restlessness of european labor during the war and especially the proletarian revolution in russia in november nineteen seventeen some anxiety was early expressed as to the stand which organized labor might take in the united states it was however soon dispelled samuel gompers speaking for the american federation of labor declared that this is labor's war and pledged the united support of all the unions there was some dissent the socialist party denounced the war as a capitalist quarrel but all the protests combined were too slight to have much effect american labor leaders were sent to europe to strengthen the wavering ranks of trade unionists in war-worn england france and italy labor was given representation on the important boards and commissions dealing with industrial questions trade union standards were accepted by the government and generally applied in industry the department of labor became one of the powerful war centers of the nation in a memorable address to the american federation of labor president wilson assured the trade unionists that labor conditions should not be made unduly onerous by the war and received in return a pledge of loyalty from the federation recognition of labor's contribution to winning the war was embodied in the treaty of peace which provided for a permanent international organization to promote the worldwide effort of labor to improve social conditions the league of nations has for its object the establishment of universal peace runs the preamble to the labor section of the treaty and such a peace can be established only if it is based upon social justice the failure of any nation to adopt humane conditions of labor is an obstacle in the way of other nations which desire to improve the conditions in their own countries the american navy in the war as soon as congress declared war the fleet was mobilized american ports were thrown open to the warships of the allies immediate provision was made for the increasing number of men and ships and a contingent of war vessels was sent to cooperate with the british and french in their life and death contest with submarines special effort was made to stimulate the production of submarine chasers and scout cruisers to be sent to the danger zone convoys were provided to accompany the transports conveying soldiers to france before the end of the war more than three hundred american vessels and seventy-five thousand officers and men were operating in european waters 
Though the German fleet failed to come out and challenge the sea power of the Allies, the battleships of the United States were always ready to do their full duty in such an event. As things turned out, the service of the American Navy was limited mainly to helping in the campaign that wore down the submarine menace to Allied shipping. The War in France Owing to the peculiar character of the warfare in France, it required a longer time for American military forces to get into action, but there was no unnecessary delay. Soon after the declaration of war, steps were taken to give military assistance to the Allies. The regular army was enlarged, and the troops of the National Guard were brought into national service. On June thirteenth, General John J. Pershing, chosen head of the American Expeditionary Forces, reached Paris and began preparations for the arrival of our troops. In June, the vanguard of the army reached France. A slow and steady stream followed. As soon as the men enrolled under the draft were ready, it became a flood. During the period of the war, the army was enlarged from about 190,000 men to 3,665,000, of whom more than 2 million were in France when the armistice was signed. Although American troops did not take part on a large scale until the last phase of the war in 1918, Several battalions of infantry were in the trenches by October 1917, and had their first severe encounter with the Germans early in November. In January 1918, they took over a part of the front line as an American sector. In March, General Pershing placed our forces at the disposal of General Foch, commander-in-chief of the Allied armies. The first division, which entered the Montdidier salient in April, soon was engaged with the enemy taking with splendid dash the town of Contigny and all other objectives, which were organized and held steadfastly against vicious counter-attacks and galling artillery fire. When the Germans launched their grand drives toward the Marne and Paris in June and July 1918, every available man was placed at General Foch's command. At Below Wood, at Chateau Thierry, and other points along the deep salient made by the Germans into the French lines, American soldiers distinguished themselves by heroic action. They also played an important role in the counterattack that smashed the salient and drove the Germans back. In September, American troops, with French aid, wiped out the German salient at San Miel. By this time General Pershing was ready for the great American drive to the northeast in the Argonne Forest, while he also cooperated with the British in the assault on the Hindenburg Line. In the Meuse-Argonne battle, our soldiers encountered some of the most severe fighting of the war and pressed forward steadily against the most stubborn resistance from the enemy. On the 6th of November, reported General Pershing, a division of the First Corps reached a point in the Meuse opposite Sedan, 25 miles from our line of departure. The strategical goal which was our highest hope was gained. We had cut the enemy's main line of communications, and nothing but a surrender or an armistice could save his army from complete disaster. Five days later the end came. On the morning of November 11th, the order to cease firing went into effect. The German army was in rapid retreat, and demoralization had begun. The Kaiser had abdicated and fled into Holland. The Hohenzollern dreams of empire were shattered. In the 52nd month, the World War, involving nearly every civilized nation on the globe, was brought to a close. More than 75,000 American soldiers and sailors had given their lives. More than 250,000 had been wounded or were missing or in German prison camps. End of section 7